lean towards three quarter fullard. Um, certainly, you know, in Europe, there's nothing but three quarter fullard. Um, so I made it really for the European market. But there's a lot of people now using three quarter fullard in the UK, and I think the reason is because we have a lot of warm bloods, a lot of people just riding on arenas. You know? And I am 98% concave, you know, concave through and through, always have been, you know, and that's because I used to ride horses. <laughs> and if you ever ride a horse across country on a flat shoe and then ride on a concave shoe, that man will tell you, you're going to fall on your ass. You, know? I mean, you don't get the traction you, as you do with a concave. Concave is designed for horses' feet, you know. And it is, uh, you can do stuff with concave that you can do with a flat shoe, it's lighter than a flat shoe. Um, gives you traction, it's beautiful. However, I think if you're riding on arenas and dressage and uh, show jumping, if they're just warm blood, sometimes concave isn't always coarse enough for some point, you know? So, hence, we thought we'd, I thought I'd design a three quarter foot shoe. You have to go. No, you're right. Shuffle that in the front. <laughs> yeah. so, that's great, we've got him on film late again. <laughs> as well, you've got, you've got some front chicken parts. So they've got a few features in these shoes that are a, bit, a little bit different than some other shoes, like the both fronts and hinds are sided left and right. Traditional sort of um, eight nail pattern, you know, the European eight nail pattern. The size like the European shoes, like the Kirkhart's, not like our concave shoes. Um, the front shoe's got that little bit of a, I don't know what you call it, a set toe, roll toe break over assistance, whatever you call it, I don't know. Um, but the reason for that, obviously, you know, whenever you put a set of shoes on horses and feet, when you come back, when you come back after a week or after a day, or after four weeks, always that toe is worn out, isn't it? Doesn't matter what the horse does, it's always worn out. So why not just give it to him to start? And I always do that with concave anyway, just fold that concave edge, outside edge in. So, Put that feature on those shoes. Um, decent strong clips, and because the clips are radius, they fit really quite easily. Actually, you only have to burn them in, really cutting them. Um, and also, they're boxed off ready. You've seated out and boxed off. So, and that's quite a useful feature because Owen Dave was just an idiot. And I remember Owen's dad saying, Bill man, use your hammer to box off. Don't use your hands. And so, because they're boxed off ready, you can just add to the boxing if you need to with your hammer. So, you really need to stick them on the linen shoe. You know? Anyway, that's, um, they're the shoes, you know, they're going to be available in uh, June in a decent sort of range. Uh, and the sizes are slightly different because they go like a triple zero, double zero, zero, and then there's a half size, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I'm probably going to do a 2.5 as well because after I had a horse yesterday I, was, I shod and I was in between a 2 and a 3, you know what I mean? And you always are with those shoes, you know, what I always find with... If I'm ever putting any curve cards on, you know, I'm always like, that doesn't fit and that doesn't fit. What am I going to do? Stretch one or cut it down or box it off, you know what I mean? So I'll put a little half size in there. And the, the section is different with every size shoe, so it's kind of scaled up and down. So always the shoe is in, a, in proportion. Horseshoe in. That's what we're going to do next. So you've got that shoe off. <laughs> the only time this horse gets shot is in a demonstration or if Johnny and I are having a practice. So he's got. Plain stats, four from ladies on. Shot 10 weeks ago. So the shoeing process that I develop, uh, develop as I adopt every day, um, and I always work with apprentices. I've had some really good apprentices, luckily. I've got some good apprentices now. Ish. No, I'm very lucky. I work with some really good lads. Uh, and I, the reason I work with, apprentice, with an apprentice is because I'm just too old and knackered. I can't, I can't show on my own. You know, clenching kills me. So I tend not to do it. And I also, it's more fun with shoeing with somebody, you know? So I do. And so we always shoe in pairs. Um, and it's just, you know, there are, there are operations involved with shoeing and you're as, you're as quick as your slow op, slowest operation. So you, if you put more operations in, you become quicker, actually. So the first operation, first part of the process that I always do is walk and drop the horse up before I shoe it. Every single one, without fail. Anybody else do that? How many people walk and trot horses up before you shoot? Most. How many of you? Anybody got hands? 
Well, that's more than, the, more than the previous groups. Most of them don't. Who doesn't ever walk and trot before you shoot? Not ever. Not ever, Not but regularly. sometimes. Not regularly. No. And there's a few reasons for it, and really important reasons, you know? Like foot balance. Anterior, posterior, I bet we'd all agree on anterior, posterior foot balance. If you can get that foot in line with the hoof pattern, hoof pattern axis in line, you're about right, aren't you? And how about medial lateral balance? I bet everybody's got a different idea of medial lateral balance. Every single one of us. We all do something, we are to go long axis, short axis, sole plane, frog plane, hairline, you know. There are all many different ways of assessing medial lateral balance, but the best way, I think, is have that all walk up in front of you, see how he puts his foot to the floor. See if he lands level, see if he lands outside first, inside first, and he'll tell you a, a hell of a lot about the way he actually puts his foot down on the floor, and if he's clever and he's compensating for a foot imbalance and he tries to land, make himself land level, he'll put his stride out. He'll move in a different way, and horse, a lot of clever horses can do that. You leave him high outside, he'll, he'll work out how to land level, but he won't, be, he won't be feeling right. And I think not every horse is, you know, can land level or probably wants to land level because confirmation doesn't always dictate it. But I think the majority of them would like to. And we determine how, we, you know, how that foot is balanced, don't we? I still go on long axis, always go on long axis. I think the majority of some of the trim and seahorses that are trimmed to long axis, they usually land level, and that's the reason. There's, there's not many people in the group we can have a conversation. Anybody disagree or agree? I like it. Disagree. Good. Well, if you've got a, a leg performing you below the pet lock, sometimes you need the short axis just to keep the foot under the leg. <coughs> so it's forward, you lock the axis so down, you look tight, and then Nonsense. you never get that back. See? <laughs> See, it's great to have a conversation. Talking through your ass. <laughs> <laughs> so foot trimming. Um, also, I was talking about trotting. You know, trot and, trot and horse before you shoot, I think it's really, really important actually. There's a number of different reasons. I think it's nice to develop a bit of a, an eye for movement, you know. Um, I think also, you know, you're part of a team, aren't you? You know, you're just, what you do is just part of the whole team that looks after that horse, especially if you're shooting competition horses. Trainer, rider, probably the vet. Osteopath, Tharia, you know, you can be a part of that team and you can probably see things that maybe some other people don't see. So if you trot it and you look at its movement, you can contribute to, you know, your opinion of how it is, you know, and, um, and also there's another reason. Um, I mean, how many of us have ever been called back to a lame horse? Who hasn't? Robbie's never been called back to a lame horse. Amazing, you're so good. You are brilliant. Good in now we all have, haven't we? And how do we know that it wasn't lame before we shot it? Uh, how do you know without trotting it? You know, not a clue. And I can, I can tell you there's been a hundred, more than a hundred occasions when I've pulled horses out just before I shot it, trot it up, that's a bit, a bit lame on this right front. Here you go, I've just ridden it. It was sound, well, it's fucking sound now, you know? So what would happen in that situation? You know, it's obvious what would happen. But that's not just the reason, you know, it's not just to be a smart ass and, you know, cover yourself like it is like an insurance policy. That's not the reason. The point is that you've identified something that's wrong with that horse. Now they can actually try and find out what's wrong with it, you know. So I think it's really important. Never shoot anything unless I walk and trot it. Anybody else going to adopt it? <coughs> you will. Robbie's going to. I'll try it. Good point. You can't trot up the road though if you shoot it in the gate, right? <laughs> it is tricky, yeah. yeah. Do you trot horses up every six weeks, every single time you shoot them? Every single time, yeah. Four, yeah. Weeks. Four weeks. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. 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 it's always different, isn't it? It's, you know, it's, and also it's doing something different every time you shoot it. It's doing something different. It's at the stage of its training where it might be, it might be doing road work at the start, then it might go on to uh, doing some fast work, it might be doing some dressage, it might be training cross country, it's doing all sorts of different things and that's and also the feet change, don't they? Feet change every time you go and see them because of the conditions, you know. So I think, you know, it's, the assessment is really important and the assessment of it is, you know, finding out what it does and what it's actually doing right now this part of this training is really important. I don't, 
do much trimming either, you know. I don't really like feet trimmed down tight. Because <coughs> everything you, you see is there to protect something. So why take the protection away? However, 10 weeks of foot growth requires a bit of trimming. Live soil out, it's all flaky shit that's coming off. There's nothing worse than over trimming feet. I hate it. I hate it in competition. I hate it in everyday work. I know you've got to get feet lined up and set up. But, but I think feet need depth, you know. Horses feet, there's P3 and far from the floor anyway, is it, you know. So depth is always good. You know, everything there is there for protection. So leave it on, you know. And you know, even if you agree with that, It's uh, really important to train your hands as well to agree with you, you know. Because your hands sometimes do shit that you didn't really want to do. Do you know that? And um, competitions, you know, you go to competitions and uh, you go like, I'm judging a competition, the guy goes, uh, that's my foot prep. It's uh, nice and level, like, but you skinned it, you know, it's like, you took too much out of the soul, you know. I didn't touch it. What he meant to say is, I didn't mean to touch it, but what I did, I picked the foot up and I went like that, and then I thought, I'm not going to trim it. And it happens so many times, doesn't it? You see it all the time. I see it, you know, sometimes daily, you know. And the first thing, out with the knife, and then you think about a bit off the outside, but, you know, just forget the knife. Wire brush it, just clean it out. Think about it before you before you can touch it. You know. So train your hands to do the, the things you want to do. Really, really important. And again, shoe selection, shoe size is really important. Um, Have you seen anybody struggle to fit shoes? Have any, you know, some of your apprentices or some of your workers, have you seen anybody really struggle when they're fitting back and forth to the foot three, four, five times? Usually it's because they select the wrong shoe. You know? Nothing more difficult is it fitting a shoe that actually isn't suitable for that foot. Really, really tricky. You select the right shoe, fitting is a piece of history. How many people think that uh, foot preparation is the most important part of shoeing? How many don't? So you all do that? You just didn't hear that? It's true. How many of you got arms that go up in the air? Seriously, how many, how many of you think the foot prep is the most important part of shoeing? Because I don't. I'm the only one that doesn't. Listen. It is really important. It is really seen it for the I thought that was just going to be lazy. 
completely relaxed. Okay. So I like wine last night. See, I think foot prep is really important. No, don't get me wrong. But equally as important is shoe shape, shoe placement. Yeah, one person the other, isn't it? But if you want to do, if you want to develop strong feet, your shoe has to correspond with the shape of that foot. P3, as you know, that thing that Craig put up, the um, the technique of using that contour gauge, the Jim Quick kind of thought of, you know. But the principle behind that is absolutely it's invaluable to creating and maintaining strong feet. It really is, you know. If you, if you have the shoe the same shape as the Connery Banks, what you're trying to do is get the same shape as P3. You can't see P3 with an X-ray. So your next best thing is to look at the Connery band. If you see the shape of that and then your shoe follows that shape, usually you end up with feet really strong, equal angles, no dishes or flares, and you maintain it. What happens if you put square toed shoes on horses' feet? What happens to the feet after three, four, five shoes? What happens? What happens if you put big bold toes on? What happens if you put pointy toes on? It goes that shape. The feet always follow the shape of the shoes you put on, always. Because the steel is stronger than the horn, isn't it? You determine the shape of that horse's feet and the strength of his feet by the shape of the shoes you put on. So why not put something on there that corresponds with it? The best way to look at it is to look at the coronary band from right above it. So if on the front foot you just hang it forward, you look at down the coronary band and then you look at your distal border of your foot. But if those two run parallel, you're pretty close, you know. If you try and look at the coronary band like, you know, just look at, looking at it from frontwards, you get a different view. Where's one of those shoes? So like you, if you look at that shoe from that angle, it's a different shape than that, isn't it? Completely different. So you must always look right down it to get the true shape. So bearing in mind that, I know that that hind foot is a bit pointier than this shoe. So I've got to make sure that the toe is the same shape. So I always start with the toe whenever any shoe, same like when you're shoe making. Always start at the toe. Well, you came back, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm room one of me over. A bit tight in the tail.
How many of you use a bowel door to fit? How many people fit with a bowel door? Yeah. Great, aren't they, those bowel doors? Just fucking hang it all out and grind it off. Lovely. I think they're really useful though, you know, just to tidy up. I think there's, you know, I see a lot of feet with, you know, shaped shoes that don't really, don't really correspond to the shape of the foot. And they just make it too easy, you know. I'll say that on the grind there. Glasses. Sorry. Stuff Anton Corona does with his nails. I think that's pretty slick. Yeah. Which hand was he holding the nails in? In this one, in those two fingers. Oh, right. Just like Rob Ranieri does, you know. Winnie. But magic in it. it produces the nail out of his hand like a. while this nice fella clenches for me. Just, just, just everyday clenches. Johnny Atkinson, sound the system, proper job. Question. Yeah. When you prepped, you thought you didn't start, you didn't look at it. Is that for any particular reason? You just, you're doing it by the... I'm, 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 trip, quite honestly, I'm, I'm finishing the trim of my art shoe. Bit of competition is a completely different oh, of game. Of course, of course, but you know? we're talking daily sort of practical, good sound, practical yep. principles. Just you know. And hind feet, I would you know foot, foot balance on hind feet. I do on the floor when it's stood oh, on them. You know, <coughs> on a front foot, yeah, I think because I trim to long axis, I might just <laughs> sight it and have a look down it. You know, um, but yeah. long axis on hind feet, it's underneath that metatarsal. You know? Dead down the centre of the toe, even angles both sides. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and again, you know, I rarely dress them forward. If I 
of our boots like dressing forward shit. No. Really, I don't dress feet forward on an everyday basis unless it really needs it. You know, I thought it was ten, 10 weeks it needed a bit of dressing forward in front. And the reason for that is because it's a really, what is the most difficult part of shoeing? How many of you, you all do competitions, a lot of these competition boys. Where are competitions won and lost? Who wins the competition? The one who leaves it alone. The man that fixes it best. Yeah. yeah? Nine times out of ten, that's the, that's the bit that people aren't very good at, or not as good at, as they are trimming, the nailing right and finishing. Right In a competition you do, yeah. To make the trim yeah. easy to do the Totally. You know, but you, what it is, you fix it a perimeter. Very difficult, you know, that's a very, very difficult skill test to master, fit in a perimeter. So why give yourself a hard time every day? Why not get the shoe, the right shape that you want it, fit it in the right place, whack it off later? You know, why not? Goodbye, clench my own feet. <laughs> <laughs> See, now that is a very good point. It's a very good point and I totally agree with it. Because if you're working on your own, you kind of want to do a bit now when you foot prep and a bit later. However, I work with apprentices and the last thing I want them to do is give me a shape that I can't fit to you know so they can have all the hard work taking the shit off after can you Steve but I think if you are on your own that's what I would do if I'm working on my own if I ever am working on my own I don't I don't trim it to the point where I've got to fit to that perimeter I just trim a bit to save my work clenching but my point is the key to it is shoe shape and if you over trim your feet to start and give yourself a perimeter to com you're committed to, then you can't do anything else but fix that perimeter, can you? you know? And then it becomes really difficult. Then you probably aren't going to always get the shape on there that that foot wants or you want to put on there because you're fitting to something that you can nail on safely. Any other questions? What's the time, bruv? What time should I have finished? I'm not sure what our hour is we are. He's got an agenda. Yeah. Oi, you got an agenda. <laughs> you got an agenda? You got an agenda? You got an agenda. Yeah, you have. Uh, Come in here with your short <laughs> axis. Got an agenda, Sam. Yeah, we start with Craig, Craig, Craig sort of now. 2.35. So now then, fuck off. Yeah, that's it. Bye. <laughs>